That's a very well-behaved Kincaid crab, isn't it? You can quiet it down right away. That's how it always happens. It doesn't happen in the faculty meetings. Uh, welcome to the 2014 Distinguished Alumni Awards Program and Reception. Thank you so much for coming here and being with us. My name is Andy Martiri, the headmaster of Kincaid. I've been headmaster since last July 1st. People have asked me how things are going, and I've said my standard joke has been things must be going pretty well. I already have the fifth longest tenure of any headmaster here at Kincaid. <laughs> of course, I'll be saying that for the next 17 years, so the joke's gonna get a little stale. But again, uh, welcome and good evening. I am, I am honored to kick off the program tonight. I've heard it said that one of the measures of a great school is the strength of its alumni. Now, in that measure, Kincaid, pla Kincaid passes with flying colors. And what a great turnout tonight for this special program. I'm told that for many of you, this is your first time back, maybe perhaps since your graduation, first time back in many years, so welcome back. And we do have something in common, as this is my first Distinguished Alumni Awards program. Prior to coming to Kincaid, I was the headmaster at Calvert School in Baltimore for nine years. I have three children at Kincaid, eighth grade daughter, sixth grade son, and kindergarten son. So next year, I will have a child in all three divisions of the school, which means that not only will I have uh, at least a small pulse on what's happening, but get about 38 Kincaid emails per day from all the different teachers and administrators. You can, if you, if you so wish, you can follow me on Twitter, at Andy Martiri. I've been stuck at about 574 followers for about a month, and my self-esteem is pretty low. Um, but you're not allowed to freeload off the website. You can go to the website and just, and just see my, my tweets there. You've got to follow me and sign up so my numbers go up. So why did I come to Kincaid? Why did I decide to move from, from Baltimore to, to Houston? and from Calvert to Kincaid, there's a few reasons. First of all, when I, when I interviewed, and, and Don North, my predecessor, was, was so kind to spend a great deal of time with my family and me when we visited, um, Don explained that, that Kincaid had a genuine commitment to arts and athletics, as well as academics, and I had to take him at his word for it. And what, what seemed like was the case when I interviewed uh, really is the case really is the case. I've been here nine months, and I can say, in fact, that there is, as you know, such a strong and robust commitment to, as the mission statement says, balanced growth in all areas. Our program and offerings are second to none in terms of what we offer, offer in terms of both breadth and depth. And just a snapshot of the last 24 hours of what has been happening on campus and slightly off campus illustrates that. Yesterday afternoon and, and tonight, we hosted what has to be the biggest middle school track meet in Houston. I've never seen as many kids or buses as I did last night. <laughs> Caused a few traffic problems, but we won't talk about that. We have a multi-day ISAS Arts Festival at St. John's this year. Kincaid hosted a few years ago. We have 125 students participating there. It's a three-day festival. Uh, this morning, we had Lieutenant Commander uh, Escher uh, speak here. We got a standing ovation from the upper school students. That says something. That says something. The upper school students give a very quick and authentic standing ovation. And at lunch today, uh, we had an absolutely wonderful ceremony. We have a young man named Casey Cowan, who's a senior, and he got his appointment today. It was a ceremony for him to get his appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy. We have about 250 people come, and Casey is an outstanding scholar an athlete, uh, he's been an All-American wrestler the last two years, and he's an actor, and tonight, right now, um, he is performing in the Children's Theater production over at St. John's, so he is both a scholar, athlete, and an actor. These are just a few illustrations of the well-roundedness of the Kincaid program. What was even more impressive than the curriculum when I visited uh, were the people. The people I met felt like I was meeting old friends for the first time. And they cared about Kincaid and loved the school deeply and would do anything for the school. And there was this great mix of people on the board, among our alumni and the faculty and staff, who had been at Kincaid and, and in Texas for a long time, and those who had come from across the country and the world to live in Houston and to be at Kincaid. And the final reason 
was that those same people said, we want to be great. We want to have the best possible school that we can and provide the very best possible education for our students. And that is what we are trying to do here at Kincaid, is to pursue excellence. And I would really never say that we are excellent, because I think even if I believe that fact, it would be fleeting, because excellence is a moving target. But we are going to continue to pursue excellence vigorously. I saw this pursuit of excellence firsthand when I attended the Alumni Association's board retreat in February. The board is committed to the best ideas for future programming to better serve our alumni, both here in Houston and across Texas and around the country, and to help keep our alumni better connected with each other and with the school. You will hear more about these ideas later in the program and in the months ahead. I look forward to meeting more alumni as I travel around the country in the future. Now I'd like to take a moment to introduce Mike Pearson, a graduate of the class of 1971 and chairman of the Distinguished Alumni Awards Committee. Mike entered Kincaid in kindergarten, attended the University of Texas at Austin, and graduated with high honors in 1975. He received his JD degree at the University of Texas School of Law in 1978. He practices in the areas of oil and gas and energy law, and currently serves as co-chair of Jackson Walker's Energy Practice Group. Mike and his wife Shirley are proud Kincaid parents of Elizabeth Pearson Bigelow, 05, and Ben Pearson, class of 2010. My pleasure to welcome Mike to the podium to begin the awards ceremony. Thank you very much, Mike. Andy, thank you very much. I want to welcome everyone to the uh, to the ceremony tonight. This is one of the high points of the school year, uh, the Distinguished Alumni Award Ceremony. Uh, just as a matter of clarification, uh, Andy said that he uh, encouraged you to, uh, to go on Twitter with him. I'd like to make sure that everyone knows that I do not tweet. Uh, I, I do not have a Twitter account, and I try to text no more than absolutely necessary. <coughs> the Distinguished Alumni Awards were established in 1990 by the Alumni Association to honor outstanding alumni and non-alumni friends of the school for their service to the school and its community. Uh, this award celebration is the highlight of our, of our alumni activities of the year. I've had the privilege of being uh, on and chairing the uh, alumni, uh, Distinguished Alumni Awards Committee for several years, including this year. And uh, it is always an interesting and challenging but uh, very enjoyable task. Uh, tonight, uh, we have a number of past winners of these awards in the audience. I'm going to call some names that I've been given, and then uh, if there's any others, I'll ask you to stand as well. But uh, we are, I'm told, and I know I saw, saw this fellow, John Berman is here, uh, Barbara Cooney. Uh, Some, uh, 
uh, giving some introductions of the people who are actually going to introduce our award winners tonight. Uh, and I'm going to ask each one of our introducers to stand as I call as I, as I call them. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Yoav Kaufman is a is a member of the class of 1998. He uh, got his undergraduate education at the University of Texas, where he started off in the in the business honors program studying finance. He appears to have had an epiphany where he decided to not operate on financial models and to go start operating on the people. And uh, so he switched. He switched majors, became a pre-med major, and upon graduation from Texas, was admitted to the Baylor College of Medicine. He is now in his final year of residency in plastic and reconstructive surgery at Baylor, and uh, he will, I think, next year be starting a fellowship in hand surgery uh, at Baylor. So please welcome Dr. Ewell. Our second present presenter is somebody whom we've seen around here a time or two, Don Hall. <laughs> Don retired as Kincaid's fourth headmaster uh, in July two 2013 after 17 years of uh, terrific leadership. We're all very grateful to Don for his many contributions to Kincaid, uh, including his ability to lead major fundraising campaigns. One of those campaigns is, in fact, responsible for the, uh, the lovely theater uh, that we sit in here, named for Lenny Katz, uh, a member of the class of 84, uh, which is a class that is celebrating its 30th reunion this weekend. Uh, Don and his wife, Mary, I understand, are thoroughly enjoying the tournament, and uh, the extra time it allows them to travel and especially visit with their grandchildren. Don. Our final award presenter is also someone who I think is probably familiar to many of the former students here, Ruth Eric. <laughs> Before we started, I confirmed that Ms. Eric taught both of mine. So, uh, uh, a native of Massachusetts, she holds a bachelor's degree from Wheaton College and a master's degree from Southern Connecticut. She had a 42-year teaching career, uh, including 37 years at Ken K, primarily as an English teacher in middle school. Ruth and her husband, Ellie, are proud parents of Adam and Michael and have two grandchildren at Kid K, Nikki, who is in the 11th grade, and Tommy in the 9th grade. Uh, Ruth and Ellie will celebrate their 60th uh, anniversary this summer. So welcome, Ms. Eric. And with that, I will now give you Dr. Joel Kaufman to introduce our first award winner. All right. I have to say, financial models were a lot more complex than some of the surgeries. It was much easier to switch to that. Anyways, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to get this opportunity to introduce my good friend, Charlie Escher. Charlie started Kincaid in kindergarten, but I only met him when I entered in sixth grade. By that point, he was already an academic star, and all the teachers loved him. How could you not love a guy that's always smiling? He's kind, he's smart, and he's just a super athlete. He fit right in, and he really took advantage of every opportunity he had here at Kincaid. He was involved in student government, he was a three-sport star, and actually played on the undefeated SBC championship football team of 1997. A couple of us were on it. He managed to graduate, he even managed to graduate cum laude in 1998 amongst his other accolades. By the end of high school, you knew he had the right stuff. <laughs> and he was really gonna, he was ready to launch and take off to great success. <laughs> I have to use that, sorry, Charlie. <laughs> After graduation, he attended the, Na the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. As a midshipman, he enjoyed the leadership opportunities uh, and he was selected to be the executive officer of his, com uh, of his company of 120 midshipmen. During summers of the, at the academy, he learned urban warfare and small unit tactics with the Marines, operated a nuclear submarine, and navigated a ship from Annapolis to Boston. But his favorite activity was getting to fly aircraft with the Navy pilots. Char Charlie graduated from the Naval Academy in 2002 with a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering and he set his sights on becoming a pilot. He began flight school in Corpus Christi, and in 2005, he completed his first carrier landing. 
Having earned his wings of gold as a, as a naval aviator, Charlie was sent to Virginia to fly the F-18 Super Hornets, the Navy's newest and most capable fighter jet. He quickly earned numerous qualifications and perfected the skills of dive bombing, dropping guided weapons, mid-air refueling, air combat maneuvering, and flight leadership. Then, he learned to do all of that at night. When his training was complete, more than three years after beginning flight school, he, de he, uh, he deployed on an aircraft carrier to the Middle East, and on multiple occasions was called upon to employ weapons in support of ground troops taking fire in Afghanistan. After completing two deployments in three years, Charlie was selected as the Navy's top candidate for training at a, as a test pilot, and he was sent to England for the Empire, te uh, Empire Test Pilot School as part of the Navy's exchange program with Great Britain. As a test pilot, he evaluated, he, he evaluated over 20 aircrafts, including fighter jets, stunt planes, helicopters, and transporters. He then returned to the U.S. and used his experience to develop new weapons and system upgrades for all three variants of the F-18. In 2012, Charlie had to put his test pilot experience on hold as he was sent back to, operational, to an operational F-18 squadron based near Fresno, California. Three months later, he was again deployed with his new squadron for almost nine months aboard the, air, the carrier USS Nimitz, and he recently returned from the deployment three months ago. Charlie has accumulated over 2,400 flight hours and has flown 25 different aircrafts, flown over 550 carrier landings on five different uh, aircraft carriers, and has completed three combat deployments where he has flown close air support missions over Afghanistan, Iraq, and Somalia. He's been awarded for four air medals for combat missions and has earned recognition as a top hook and top stick. Charlie currently lives in Fresno, California, and serves as one of four department heads in Strike Fighter Squadron 154, the Black Knights, which consists of over 200 officers and sailors and 12 Super Hornet fighter jets. I know, I know what all you guys are thinking. This sounds a lot like Top Gun on steroids. <laughs> Yet, with all these high-flying accomplishments, Charlie still manages to remain very much grounded. You can always feel the genuine sincerity when talking to him about his work, his goals, and even the mundane aspects of life. He's a true officer and gentleman. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Commander Charlie Escher. Thank you all very much for coming. It's uh, quite an honor to be back here in Kincaid. Thank you for the introduction. You all, that was awesome. Um, it's really nice to see a bunch of familiar faces in the crowd as well. It's been a while since I've been back to Kincaid. I missed the 10 year and 15 year reunions, unfortunately. I was out at sea. Uh, I mean, the Navy wouldn't give me a uh, fighter jet to bring back to Houston for, uh, for the weekend. So uh, maybe next time. Um, <clears throat> But uh, it's, it's truly an honor to be here uh, at this amazing school again. Um, I will say that um, after leaving the academy, getting to flight school was a, a unique and very new experience for me, very different from uh, the academics that I had uh, done here at Kincaid and at the Naval Academy. It was sort of a new, uh, a new field that I was not experienced in, so that was uh, an immediate challenge immediately. Um, but it was a unique combination of academics and athletics, if you, if you bear with me. Um, it uh, involved a lot of study, a lot of memorization, but uh, when it came down to it, just like in sports, it all, it all you know, came to a head when you were airborne in the jet or in the airplane and you had to make it happen when the pressure was on. So there are a lot of parallels uh, that I found between flying and playing sports in high school and college. Um, <clears throat> the biggest question mark as I was going through flight school and, uh, you know, People would get weeded out all, along the way until about after two and a half years, uh, I'd flown about 300 hours in airplanes, three different airplanes, felt pretty good, felt pretty strong, but there was just one big hurdle to overcome, and that was landing on the aircraft carrier. And everybody always talks about how big an aircraft carrier is, holds 5,000 people, uh, it's three football fields long, almost a football field wide, it's 17 stories high, it's an enormous ship. Well, I have a slide for you to show how small of a ship it actually is. <laughs> if, you, if you can't find it, it's right in the middle of the picture there. There's that tiny little structure in the middle of the huge ocean that, uh, that I feel land the airplane on. And it's, uh, it's, it's mind-boggling, uh, especially the first time uh, I tried to do it. Um, 
Landing on a carrier, again, is like nothing else I've ever experienced before. There's no way to simulate that. Uh, you can't go to a simulator and get the feel of it. Uh, landing on a runway is nothing like landing on a carrier. In fact, I almost have to forget everything I have learned about how to land uh, on a runway and just kind of figure it out when I, once I get to the carrier. So that was a, a big challenge and something that was always looming in flight school to, uh, to accomplish. Now, not everybody is successful doing it, um, but, uh, but I got a shot at it and sort of got better step by step and was able to, uh, to do it. So on the next slide, I have another picture for you. This is what it looks like when you uh, turn the corner. Uh, this is the view you get from the jet, uh, essentially 15 to 18 seconds prior to landing. And I say that a specific time, like 15 to 18 seconds, and that's no kidding. Uh, that's what you have to shoot for. Anything outside of that, and you risk uh, getting waved off uh, because there's not enough time for the jet behind you to, uh, to land without crashing on top of you. So everything is very, very precise when it comes to landing on the carrier and just in naval aviation in general. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the view that I've seen quite a few times. Um, and basically, you only have a few seconds here to get all your parameters correct, uh, setting up your, your lineup correctly, setting up your angle attack, and then looking at the tiny little uh, glide slope source on the left side of the ship, uh, we call it the ball, which is uh, amber light with uh, a string of green lights kind of level with it. Or at least we hope it's gonna be level because that determines whether you're on a glide slope or above and below. Uh, too high and you're going to miss all the wires and uh, go around and have to try it again. Uh, too low and, uh, and then you risk crashing into the back of the ship. So, uh, so it's, the stakes are high, but it's a, it's a blast to do. <laughs> Maybe I'm just numb to it now. Uh, and I actually have a video, I think, if it's queued up, uh, to give you a quick view of what it looks like um, landing on the carrier. Going from about 150 miles an hour to zero. <laughs> the ship is moving to the right and away from you uh, as you're chasing it coming down to complicate things. Uh, you have no idea what the speed of the ship is. Uh, all you can do to judge that is look at the wake it's kicking up and just kind of make a guess and then, uh, and then you're just playing the winds and, uh, and do what it takes to get on board. So after doing that for quite a few times, I started to feel comfortable, felt good. Now it's a blast every time I do it, I promise you. Um, however, doing it at night is a completely different story. Nothing about that is fun whatsoever. And I actually have a video of the nighttime as well. There's not a whole lot to see. After doing that for a while and, uh, and qualifying on the carrier, then uh, as you all have said, I was sent to Virginia Beach, Virginia. I joined my first uh, fighter squadron out there and did uh, two deployments with that squadron. Um, that was a blast and, uh, and a big eye-opening experience, obviously, uh, since we are in a wartime um, uh, period in our uh, country's history. So um, joined that squadron. Uh, I showed up right when they were uh, kind of in the middle of workups uh, for the upcoming deployment. Um, so I did my best to get up to speed and, uh, and be ready to go and deploy with those guys. So, um, so I went on my first combat deployment in uh, October of 2006, and uh, I think I have a picture for you. 
of um, just some of the stages. Okay, so here, obviously, the uh, carrier environment is one of the most dangerous places. Uh, you can be, in, you can kind of see why with uh, aircraft landing so close to, uh, to people, equipment, other airplanes. Um, occasionally it goes wrong, unfortunately, but, uh, but it's very uh, planned out and very precisely done. Uh, it's a really, it's really a team effort uh, every time we're recovering jets on board. But the next slide. Um, this is the aircraft carrier Dwight D. Eisenhower on my second deployment, uh, going through the Suez Canal in Egypt on our way to uh, the Middle East. So a typical combat flight, if you go to the next slide, um, this is a jet launching out um, in the, uh, the Middle East as well. Um, typical combat flight is, uh, is a pretty involved process. We uh, start a mission brief three hours prior to launch and uh, we study our target area. We, uh, we talk to uh, the ground troops via Merc chat or even uh, security line telephone from the aircraft carrier to uh, the field in Afghanistan. Um, and sort of plan out our, uh, our plan of attack, see what they have going on. Everything is based on the ground scheme of maneuver. Um, so that's what we're there to support, essentially. Um, so if you look at the next slide. Uh, first, we'll have to cross over into Pakistan. So this is on the uh, coast of Pakistan, headed north. It's about an hour-long flight to get up to Afghanistan. Uh, and once we get there, the next slide. This shows our loadout. In this case, we have uh, two fuel tanks loaded and three bombs, as well as targeting equipment. And, uh, and an air to air missile or two. Um, so that's our, our typical loadout normally when we go over there to, uh, to Afghanistan. Um, the flights are very long, so our first priority is to help out the guys on the ground. So as soon as we make contact uh, on the radio with those guys, it's, uh, it's determining what they need us to do. Sometimes it's a, it's a chill day and uh, they just have us do route clearance or look for roadside bombs or uh, search for enemy positions, etc. Other times you check in and uh, we're in the middle of a firefight and, uh, and things get hot pretty fast. So uh, always have to be on your toes and it's, uh, it's been uh, an incredible experience um, and fulfilling experience when I'm able to affect the battlefield in a way that the, uh, the ground troops stop taking fire, stop taking casualties. So that's a very, very rewarding uh, experience when, uh, when that happens for me. Uh, the flights are very, very long though. They're six to eight hours for a combat flight. I think my longest was 8.9 hours. Uh, it's a long time to be in a, in a jet like that, that you can't move around in. Um, there's nothing to eat unless you bring some snacks with you, but uh, can't bring anything that's gonna spill into the cockpit as well and, uh, and cause problems for the jet, so it's a challenge. Um, also, we can't carry near enough fuel to last that long up to uh, altitude for six and a half, uh, six to eight hours. So we have to do aerial refueling. Uh, we'll do that three to four times per flight. Uh, so it gets pretty busy and we're trying to um, sort of plan it out so we don't leave the guys on the ground high and dry while we have to go sprint and uh, go get our fuel. But when it comes time, we have to go get our fuel. We sprint over to uh, Air Force Tanker, join up as quickly as possible, and then we typically take about 2,000 gallons uh, from the Air Force Tanker, which will take about 10 minutes of flying formation. Uh, I think I do have a, a video of that as well. So. Uh, Again, all fine and good during the daytime. Let's take a look at what it looks like. Uh, this is from night vision goggles as well. Everything is different and worse at night, I promise you. Um, but uh, sometimes when we're uh, overhead, Afghanistan will actually um, get a text message in the jet, believe it or not. It'll, it'll show up in my, uh, in my instruments that says you have a text message. And you can click over to your text message and then read uh, where they're sending you, what battle's going on, who to talk to, and that kind of stuff. So the technology has advanced to the point where I'm receiving text messages about the war in my jet. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, <clears throat> on my first deployment, I, uh, I was overhead Afghanistan. Uh, we'd been working there for a couple of months, and, uh, and all of a sudden, um, it's one night, I'm planning my mission for the next day, it's about 10 o'clock at night, uh, just kind of standard 
Um, so when they are planning a mission, and all of a sudden over the loudspeaker, we get an announcement that all flights for the next day are canceled. And that never happens. That is strange. That's uh, that's like big disaster or something bad happens. <coughs> so we're all wondering what's going on. All of a sudden, about one minute later, you feel the ship take a huge turn as fast as it can, and the engines just kicked up uh, to maximum power, and we just start flying through the ocean. No idea what's going on. Uh, go to bed that night, still wondering what, uh, what we're going to be doing next, and uh, wake up in the morning, and all of a sudden, we're getting intelligence briefs about Somalia. Uh, never been there, never studied the area, um, didn't know what was going on, didn't know what my job was going to be, um, but it took us less than two days to get there from uh, on station off of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Next thing you know, two days later, we're flying missions over uh, Somalia, which is a pretty cool thing to take a step back and think about um, because the Navy is such a flexible force that we can move from one theater of warfare two days later, being a completely different theater, launching, uh, doing missions over a country like Somalia. It was strange. We later came to find out that uh, intelligence reports had pinpointed uh, several high, uh, important Taliban and Al-Qaeda leaders that were having a meeting in, uh, in Somalia, and they were sort of sitting ducks there uh, for uh, killer capture missions uh, with the troops we were working with. So cool opportunity to all of a sudden flex from what we thought our game plan was going to be all of a sudden being a completely new theater. Which was, uh, which was a really neat experience um, and something fairly unique to the Navy, I thought. Um, <clears throat> after two deployments uh, to Afghanistan, Iraq, and Somalia, um, it, was, uh, it was time for me to move on from the fleet. I did my three and a half year sea tour, uh, a couple of deployments, and now uh, I had the chance to take the next three years, be not deployable, and uh, essentially pick another job. Um, Nobody could keep up the pace of deployments that, uh, that we were on in, in the fleet operational squadrons for, uh, for more than three years, uh, trust me. So, so that was a cool experience, and I, I got selected to go to test pilot school. Neat experience to go over to England to fly with uh, pilots from eight different countries, get to fly 20 different aircraft from helicopters to business jets to transports to other fighters, um, and, uh, and really get to learn about the evolution of aircraft and, uh, and how our understanding of aerodynamics and how to build aircraft has changed. I uh, flew aircraft from, uh, they were built in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, all the way up until uh, the brand newest fighters from 2000s. So, uh, so that was a really cool experience and it allowed me to take uh, the academic studies that I did at the academy, which was uh, aerospace engineering, and apply that to, to aircraft, get to test out uh, new aircraft, fly them in their mission, and determine what was wrong with them, how to improve them and then make recommendations and then defend my recommendations on, uh, on what to improve on, the, on those aircraft. Um, so that was, uh, that was a super cool job to have after uh, going and doing uh, several uh, deployments. Um, after that, I graduated from test pilot school and they sent me to the California desert, the Mojave Desert, a strange place to live, um, but, uh, but I was out there and my job at that point was to be a test pilot for the F-18s, uh, which was awesome. I could use the experience I had on deployment and in combat and, uh, and apply that to, uh, to make upgrades on weapon systems and, uh, and, and cockpit, uh, cockpit systems for the, uh, for the F-18 for the future. So that was a really neat experience. Um, and in fact, since uh, Boeing sells the F-18 to multiple countries around the world, uh, when Malaysia, of all countries, decided they wanted to upgrade their, uh, their F-18s and, uh, and buy new weapons, um, and the United States allowed it, they sent me over there to uh, teach them how to use their new weapons and explain to them the new systems, which is a really cool opportunity um, for me there. Uh, <clears throat> so after only about a year and a half in, uh, in the test squadron, I got pulled a little bit early to go back to the fleet to, uh, to be operational again. Uh, I guess we were running out of guys or something, digging the bottom of the barrel, so I got to go uh, join another squadron on the west coast this time. So uh, that's where I currently am, living in Fresno, California, and I uh, just returned from a nine-month deployment on the USS Nimitz, uh, going back to Afghanistan uh, this past summer. Um, <clears throat> good deployment, things were good. Uh, it's a little bit different every time I go over there. Uh, the stakes have changed, the rules of engagement have changed, and uh, how hot the area has also changed uh, significantly. Um, this time, the thing that was different was uh, right at the time we were starting to head home, in about August of 2013, the ship had pointed east, because uh, we were going back uh, the long way through the Pacific Ocean, uh, pointed east to go back to California, and uh, lo and behold, we 
you start seeing things on the news about uh, serious chemical weapons and, uh, and the U.S. potential response to that. So uh, that was a unique spot to be. I was the aircraft carrier in the Indian Ocean while all this stuff was going down. So instead of heading east, sure enough, the carrier turns right back around. Uh, so I had to, you know, send cryptic messages to my parents like, yeah, don't expect me home when, uh, when I told you I'd probably be home. Uh, so next thing you know, we end up in the Red Sea, um, <clears throat> just south of, uh, of Syria there. Uh, unique experience, nobody had really gone through something like that before. Uh, but again, we're receiving intelligence um, briefs and, uh, and learning all we can about Syria, their defense systems, and, uh, and what our tactics might be if we're called upon to, uh, to do anything. Um, so we're sitting there a while, a lot of the details are classified, but I will say that, uh, that our mission that we were training for changed a lot. Uh, so it was a cool experience to, uh, to get to change uh, again and, uh, and prepare for something that we might be called to do. Instead, uh, the United States took the diplomatic route, and uh, after a while, we, uh, it was, some admiral decided we were no longer needed in the region, so we got to uh, head back to California and made it uh, just in time for Christmas. Um, overall, the Navy has been quite an adventure and, uh, and definitely an incredible leadership experience for me. Uh, it sent me to five different continents, 18 different foreign countries, uh, not counting the ones that I've uh, flown over because a lot of them didn't actually want me there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the whole time, Kincaid has been a family for me. I've kept in touch with uh, friends, teachers, um, and, uh, and it's been awesome, uh, and coaches. Uh, the support I've gotten from Kincaid has been, uh, has been incredible. Um, so uh, I've gotten letters, pictures, drawings from lower schoolers, upper schoolers, and uh, it's been an amazing support uh, and a morale boost while we're out on these uh, extended deployments, turning around every, uh, every other time to uh, go some other part of the world that didn't expect to. Um, overall, it's been uh, an inspiration uh, to be part of the Kincaid family, and I feel very honored tonight um, to be thought of after uh, so many years to be back here uh, speaking to you, to you all. Thank you very much. Some men are born to portray Top Gun pilots. That would be Tom Cruise. <laughs> Some men are born to be Top Gun pilots, and that would be Charlie Edwards. Yeah. I know I speak for uh, everybody here, Charlie, and everybody in the Kincaid community, just to tell you how proud we are. And, and I think we also want to thank, take a moment here just to thank Charlie Escher for his service to the United States. Yeah.